Welcome to episode 91 of All About Fitness. Before I go into the introduction for this episode's guest, I want to say a huge thank you to Rafi in DC. Hey man, I really appreciate the feedback. I'm glad you're liking the podcast. And keep tuning in because I have some awesome guests coming up over the next few episodes. Now, to today's guest. I've known him for a number of years. Well, I haven't known him personally, but I've read his, I've read his information for years. I've seen him speak a number of times at various conferences, and I've always enjoyed the, the opportunity I've had to kind of shoot the breeze for a little bit and pick his brain. Now, just one note, I had originally reached out to him a little while ago, but our schedules just didn't align because you can't talk movement, you can't talk function without talking about Chuck Wolf. Chuck is the owner of Human Motion so Chuck is the owner of Human Motion Associates in Orlando, Florida. His specialty is in helping people move better. He's been studying movement for more than three decades, and whether it's a grandmother who just simply wants to be able to, to walk without any discomfort, or a professional athlete looking to get back into the game, Chuck's specialty is in helping people move better so they can get stronger and enjoy their favorite activities. Chuck is also the author of Insights into Functional Training. You know, in, in today's conversation, you'll hear Chuck refer to function a, a couple different times as to, well, whatever that means. And it's important to remember that, that when you hear the term functional training, it's going to mean a little something different to each and every individual because your level of function might be different than my level of function. But regardless of what we want to do, we need to try to perform at the highest level possible and have an optimal ability to move so we don't cause any pain or discomfort. Because here's the thing, and this is what we talk about in today's episode. It might seem a little silly, but a pain at your, a pain at your ankle could affect your abdominals. Something going on at your hip could affect your shoulder. We get into some nitty-gritty details about human movement today, but you're going to understand why you might need to rethink the way that you train. Because if you're still doing muscle isolation... That just, that's not how we're wired. That's not how our body's designed to move or designed to work. We can isolate a muscle, but there's almost no movement that you do in your normal daily life that uses only one muscle at a time. So after listening to our interview today, you'll get a much better understanding of the whys and the hows behind the concept of functional training and whatever that means to you. So after a brief word from the sponsor of All About Fitness, it's a pleasure to sit down and have a conversation with Chuck Wolf the owner of Human Motion Associates in Orlando, Florida, and the author of Insights into Functional Training. What is part bench, part balance trainer, part stability ball, part jump box, and all results? The TerraCore by Vicor Fitness, specially designed to help enhance balance, strength, agility, and metabolic conditioning, the TerraCore is quickly becoming the go-to piece of workout equipment used by fitness professionals around the world. Whether you're training to earn that eight-figure contract or just trying to get in better shape, the TerraCore will help you achieve results you never thought possible. TerraCore by Vicor Fitness, the shape of things to come. Go to www.vicorefitness.com And use code AAF, that's all about fitness, AAF, to save 20% on the purchase of a TerraCore. I'm Pete McCall with All About Fitness on the line today with Chuck Wolf. Chuck, can you give us a little bit of background about what it is that you do and and your experience in the fitness industry? Pete, thank you so much for having me on your program. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, I've been in the industry almost 38 years now, and it seems like it was just a few years ago that I started, but um, I'm a master's degree exercise physiologist. I have a fellowship in applied functional science through the Gray Institute and uh, have been through my career, early in my career, involved in cardiac rehab, uh, sports performance, general fitness, uh, fitness for special populations, and today uh, I specialize in injury evaluation and gait and motion analysis. I work with everybody from grandma and grandpa to athletes of all sports at all levels. I've been blessed well, to be able to do this for a while. 
And given well, given your your experience in in longevity in the industry, how has it changed? I mean, what's really changed in the last in the last like thirty years of why you've been working with people and helping people exercise? When you say that, but you make it sound like it goes back to the caveman days, <laughs> caveman and cave woman days. But uh, I remember starting my career at a very large fitness center in the northern suburbs of Chicago, and um, uh, new members were orientated to the equipment through going through a circuit, and the circuit was on selectorized equipment because in those days it was deemed to be safer. It was in a more controlled environment. Uh, people thought that you had too many injuries with free weights and people didn't know what they were doing with free weights, but the machines were so much easier to navigate. Um, but what was interesting is that we saw more and more injuries and more and more limitations with people who strictly worked through selectorized equipment. That is not to say selectorized equipment is bad, Pete. I'm not saying that, but back in the early days, it was more of, and I heard the term circuit training so early back then, it was going from station to station in the, in, uh, with selectorized equipment. So through the, through the course of time, I saw a transition from there, and then you saw more free weights being being used again in the gyms and more space being dedicated to the free weight room and a little bit less space to the selectorized equipment. But they were still useful in, in many regards. Um, obviously, with selectorized equipment, it was more isolated thought process with with free weights. There was the bodybuilding mentality, which was an isolated process, but at the same time, you saw more freedom of movement, particularly when people in free weights or movements, and I should say movements and exercises in free weights were more uh, dedicated with with dumbbells. Then maybe 25, 30 years ago, this term of function came about, whatever that term means, but you started to see people go to more triplane movements, uh, body weight movements, utilizing ropes and dumbbells and medicine balls and bands and tubing, which became more or less mainstream for a bit. Uh, the people I was working with, and even when I first started, I found the free weights and selectorized equipment definitely gave me and the clients I'd work with hypertrophy. But uh, if you didn't work and work on flexibility, you saw a little bit of limitation in movement. I started to see clients, I started getting referral from clients who did strictly uh, selectorized equipment coming with some overuse injuries. Then we started to see this movement or, or this this trend that's now really part of the mainstream of doing triplane movements. And you saw a lot more mobility, a, a lot more explosiveness, but at the same time, some clients said they were losing or weren't getting the mass and the hypertrophy that they wanted. So that's where the hybrid programs come into play, where where or how do you blend the two? I definitely believe there is a definite need for all modalities and all types of training and all types of equipment in the fitness and sports performance world. But uh, we have to then start looking as, as the industry really took this big swing towards functional training, again, Pete, whatever the function means, uh, we better start understanding the quality of movement and why people are doing certain movement patterns, how they're doing certain movement patterns, why certain programs are put together, because it's, it's more free-flowing, um, but there better be a strategy behind it. Well, and that's why, you know, you, you, you went down the perfect path, Chuck, and the reason why I asked you is because when a lot of people, when a lot of us started, including myself, I mean, I started working in fitness back in the late 80s, and it was putting people through that circuit, you know, that weight training circuit, and the whole idea was you're trying to get big muscles. You know, that's what we saw in the movies. You know, think back to Arnold and Sylvester and, you know, all these guys running around with big movies and getting the chicks in the movies and all that stuff, and, and that's what everybody wanted, right? And so now... 
especially now that we've uh, all, I'll, I'll use the word matured a little bit. <laughs> why is, why is a movement approach to training so much more important? Why should we kind of, I don't want to say skip the machines, but you talk about triplanar motion. What exactly is triplanar motion and why is that more important when it comes to exercise? Well, if I can kind of extrapolate a little bit of what you were saying back in the eighties and, and I started in the late seventies, early eighties, um, the majority of people that were doing fitness or were members of fitness centers were the baby boomers. Now they're the ones who are, you know, well into their 60s and 70s, and that's where we start to see some of the lifestyle-related, some of the overuse injuries that are occurring. Uh, so they don't need the hypertrophy as much. Um, you're right, the movie stars definitely and the celebrities made made that impact, but <clears throat> what we have to look at, <clears throat> excuse me, is the quality of movement. And typically in the weight room, when we think of traditional methods of training, there's been a lot of isolation, single joint, uh, concentric first, one plane of motion. But all muscles, all joints, the myofascial system is designed to work in three planes of motion. And if we start emphasizing one plane of motion, we start to see a limitation quite often in the other two planes, and that's where we start to see some of these compensatory patterns and some of the injuries that start to occur, uh, the overuse injuries that start to occur, because what we found over time is that these overuse injuries, the site of the injury is not necessarily a problem, but it's a joint level above or below or two levels above or below that become limited in motion, and that's where we start to see that compensation. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what we have to appreciate, particularly as we get older, is what's the objective of the program? What's the objective of people exercising or trying to stay fit? And as the baby boomers get older, a lot of that is more quality of life, doing things, uh, activities of daily living with more freedom, with less pain, with less discomfort. Um, and how do we go about and do that? And that's where I believe understanding movement and understanding the triplane actions and reactions are going to help all populations. I don't care what age you are. I don't care what your occupation is or if you participate in sports or not. It's just going to help because that's how the body's designed to move. And let me, let me ask you this. It's always, interesting. Um, it's always interesting when you start working with somebody new and they look at you and they – Go well. Why aren't we using those machines? You know, when I've worked in commercial health clubs, you know, people will, you know, I'll, they'll, I'll become their trainer and start working with them. And they kind of look at me like, well, why aren't we using those machines over And I said, well, maybe we will at some point, but right now I need to help you move better first. When people will start working with you, Chuck, when they hire you as a trainer, as a coach, what's their expectation and how do they respond to this whole idea of multiplanar movement training? Pete, the majority, I would say. 95% of the clients and patients I work with are referred because of an injury issue or a performance issue. So when they come to me, it's they know that I'm going to look at things differently, and everybody everybody will go through a gait and motion analysis because I have to understand how they're moving, <clears throat> excuse me, and why they're moving the way they are. <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry. That's right. And that's the issue. Our industry does a great job of what, when, and how, what we're going to do today, um, what movements or what exercises or what equipment we're going to use, when we're going to use it, how we're going to use it, but our industry doesn't do a great job of why and not necessarily of saying why we're going to use it, but why is there this injury? Why is somebody limited in motion? Uh, that's a complexity. We try and figure out the whys. And then we'll figure the whys will then determine the strategies for the what and the how. So uh, when people come to us, they're live, based upon the results of the gait and motion analysis is what we use to develop strategies for their, for their training. Now, you just mentioned a little while ago about how tight and how, how limited in motion many of these clients come to us. I'm not going to build stability on top of stability. So if I see that they don't move very well in a particular plane of motion or there's a certain uh, joint segment that is limited in motion and if a client 
comes with a referral from a doc or from a physio when they've been discharged from physical therapy and they say do hypothetically core stability or hip stability and they're already too stable or they don't have the movement, I'm not going to go get them stronger right away because we have to free up that movement or that joint segment and all three planes of motion in order to allow the tissues to eccentrically load, stabilize, and then concentrically unload. So I have to look at how mobile they are and what the reactions are above and below that, that is looking. So we're looking at the quality of movement. Once we see good quality of movement, then we'll start working on the strength. And the strength can be, we'll start from a remedial movement pattern and then build from there into more complexity. But you said something that I think the industry has to really understand. And that was a question when a, when a client comes to a trainer and says, why aren't we using this piece of equipment today? I believe that the industry has to look at the wants and the needs of the client. The wants being, I want to use that, that selectorized chest press, or I want to do a dumbbell chest press because I want more hypertrophy in my pecs. That's what their want is. But based upon a gait and motion analysis or some type of movement screen, the trainer should be able to determine what the needs are of the client so they are able to enhance their movement patterns, are able to uh, enhance the, their freedom of motion, particularly in all three planes, and somehow subliminally blend the two together. Because as you know, Pete, you've got people who come in and say, I just want general fitness. You've got people who come in and say, I want to look like, as you put it, Arnold and Sylvester and so on and so forth. But the trainer may say or may think that is not necessarily the best thing for you right now. But I also want to keep this client for for the long term, and I want to meet their wants, but I also have to serve their needs. And somehow we have to blend the two together. Well, and I think that becomes – that becomes a lot of that becomes immaturity. I think as we get a little bit older – um, in terms of you become more comfortable, like, for example, dealing with clients and saying, hey, based on my experience, here's what I think you need. You may, you may tell me you want this, and I understand that. Because I think a lot of people, Chuck, they just they expect to come in and they, because they were brainwashed. Maybe they were in the, this gym 30 years ago when everything was Nautilus. And we'll talk about maybe how gyms have changed a little bit. Um, but I think that that's their expectation. They, are, they don't realize, I think – and would you agree with this, that a lot of people don't think about exercise in context of movement, yet in order to be able to do an exercise, you have to be able to move well. How would you, how would you, would you agree with that, and how would you extrapolate that? Well, it's, it's interesting you say that because how many people, there's what, 40, uh, uh, 44 million people who are in the fitness industry, uh, who are members of fitness facilities somewhere in that neighborhood? Yeah, and we've got roughly 300 million people in this country, so we're missing a big, a, a, a big majority here. Uh, face it, a lot of people don't like to exercise. They don't like the term exercise. However, it's up to the trainer now to be creative and not necessarily create that exercise environment, but to create a movement environment that involves interests of the client the hobbies of the client, the needs and the goals of the client, but also make it a somewhat social so that client doesn't think that they're doing a lot of exercise, but they're having a good time, let it be if it's the environment or if it's the relationship with the trainer. So when we, years back in the 70s and 80s, when we think, and even part of the 90s, when we think of exercise, you have to go to the gym and exercise. But now look at, movement, and I'm not going to say good, bad, or indifferent with, for instance, boot camps or trainers that take their clients outside. I'm all in favor of it if it has a rationale for the program, but the neat thing about it is the fact that that the client is just doing movement that is going to strengthen them in three planes of motion that will give them more mobility, and they don't think of it as exercise. And isn't that kind of, it's kind of funny. I mean, I learned a lot, a lot from Gary, and I know you did too. You went through his, uh, his gift program, and Gary's been a, um, been a guest on the podcast. And I think that's one of the most important things I learned from Gary is that we kind of got to, I don't want to say trick people because we're not doing it in a mean way, 
But we have to kind of get people into our way of thinking by help them realize that if they move better first, they can be able to, to do their favorite activities. How, have you seen that? And, and how do you kind of get people to understand they need to move before they can really get into exercise? Well, again, is movement part of exercise? I and mean, we have to define what the connotation of exercise is and the connotation of what movement is because obviously you need to move to exercise. And if you see or if your client uh, uh, states that a certain exercise hurts them, um, we have to step back and say, why is that hurting you? Uh, we have to look at the quality of movement in the big movement rocks, which we'll talk, talk about in a little bit. But if we can get people to move better, and that better meaning, at least how I look at it, the big movement rocks is the foot and ankle complex, the hips and the thoracic spine. If those three regions can really can really be more mobile and have better quality of movement, the movement, generally speaking and globally speaking, is going to be better. If they're more comfortable with the movement, then they're going to be more comfortable with the exercise because the exercise will, will flow a little bit more easily with less limitation. The trainer has to figure out can they move in all three planes of motion or to be able to to have a predominance in a certain plane of motion where that client will be more comfortable and maybe more successful. And, and, you know, I think that's one thing. When you go to movements, you know, we talked about big rocks and we'll get back to that. How do you find, because I know there are a couple different models out there. In your, in your experience, what are the primary movement patterns that we should be teaching people that when somebody comes in and, and they like, okay, I, I want to exercise, I'm feeling gunky, this is sore, what are the primary movement patterns that you go to? What, what patterns do you use when you, in your training? You start with gait, and then how do you work out from there? <clears throat> we'll start with gait, and I just want to see what the global patterns look like. I want to see how they move through the hips, if they are able to extend through the hips, are they able to get into hip adduction and frontal plane and side-to-side -side movement through the hips. Uh, with that, you'll see their quality of ability to rotate, and that's just through having them walk. Uh, I then drop down as they're walking and look at the ability of the of the ankle to go through dorsiflexion, or is there early heel off? When when I see the lack of dorsiflexion in an individual, that's a big red flag that that system is set up for failure. So. I want to see how how they're moving just through walking. I want to see how much thoracic rotation is taking place. Then from there, uh, we can do various excursion tests or balance reach tests by by having them do a single leg squat as an example. If that's even too advanced. And when I say single leg squat, Pete, I'm not talking about a deep squat. I'm talking about just give me three little mini squats. I want to see what the motion of the foot and ankles is taking place. Does the ankle dorsiflex, does the calcaneus evert, does the tibia internally rotate, does the forefoot abduct, does that all has to take place to allow the knee to flex and internally rotate and, and abduct and the hips to flex and internally rotate and abduct because if there's something stuck in the foot and ankle, you're going to see everything up, up the chain going to be limited in motion. So we'll do movements of a balance of a sagittal plane reach or a frontal plane reach and do some rotational uh, things. I like to have the, the client do a, a side lunge or a frontal plane lunge to, because what I found is that's a good indicator of what's going on at the adductors, and the adductors are extremely powerful influencers of what goes on in the hip. Uh, so it's movements and, and screens such as that that become – really critical. Then I look at thoracic extension and thoracic rotation. So many people are limited in the thoracic spine and the hips uh, that that's when we start to see increased risk of injury, particularly of lumbar spine injury as an example. Um, so those are the movement patterns that I will look at. Sometimes we'll have them do a lunge, but I want to make things more abbreviated, that's more controlled for the client rather than bigger movements such as a such as a deep squat or such as a a uh, long or deep lunge. Let's make it limited, and then we can slowly titrate it into deeper, more uh, dynamic movements. In, in your experience, what tends to be the causes of these dysfunction? You know, I mean, when we look at, like, dorsiflexion and dorsiflexion, 
um, for listeners that might not be familiar with it, is when you walk and you step over your foot in the middle in the middle of your, your walking stance, your gait stance, that's dorsiflexion. And if you don't have dorsiflexion, it can it can impact the rest of your body. And, and it sounds funny, but the, your foot can impact the rest of, rest of your body. In, in your experience, Chuck, and in your opinion, what what common things do that people do do your clients do on a regular basis? that affects these changes in their body. So you have to, like, undo them and get them back into a position where they can move more efficiently. Well, let's talk about just maybe lifestyle for a moment, Pete, and then we'll talk about examples of how injury can affect that as well. Cool. Um, if you have people, especially the female population, who wear high heels as an example, uh, that's going to shorten the calf and tighten the calf when – the foot's on the ground and the tibia or the shin, depending on who's, who's listening to this, as the, as the lower leg comes over the foot, as you described it during gait, uh, if, the, if the tibia can't come over the foot, typically you're going to see the calf be tight that could limit that. Now, I'm not saying that's exclusive, but that's just a common example. If the tibia doesn't go over the foot or we don't have good ankle dorsiflexion, let's move up to the hip. The hip won't extend as much, so we're going to see a tightness develop over or, or through the hip flexor. But let's turn this around a little bit. Now you've got somebody who's sitting at the at their desk a lot. They've got a sedentary job that they're seated. They may be on the computer a lot, so their hip flexors get short and tight. If the hip flexors get short and tight as an individual walks, and let's say the left foot is forward and the right leg is back. If your right hip flexor is tight, that is not going to allow the ankle to go through good ankle dorsiflexion. So lifestyle can relate to, these are just two typical examples that I commonly see that will relate to the lack of ability to ankle dorsiflex. Now, when the ankle, and you said dorsiflexion, it sounds kind of silly or crazy that it affects the rest of the system, but if you don't have that ability to dorsiflex and that same side hip can't extend, you're not going to have as efficient rotation to the opposite side. So, again, let's assume the left foot is forward, the right foot is back. Under normal healthy conditions, the right arm is going to be swinging forward, which is going to take the thoracic spine or the shoulders and rotate it to the left. What that will do is lengthen the abdominals, lengthen the back, the lats, the quadratus umborum, which are the muscles that are just above the hips that, that are, are kind of between the ribs and the hips, uh, you take the hip of the left hip. That isn't going to get lengthened because essentially what that is doing, all those motions are going through rotation or what is commonly called the transverse plane, which is our most powerful plane of motion. So now that ankle doesn't allow that to happen, which doesn't allow the hip to to extend as well, which doesn't allow rotation to the opposite side. So now we we don't get as much rotation, and we start walking more straight forward with less rotation. And think of it in an exaggerated sense, like Frankenstein. Now there's limited rotation. The hips don't move side to side. You, you don't get as, as long a stride. The tissues get shorter and tighter. The fascia system starts to become shorter and that shortness is now going to compress the joints a little bit where the articulating bones and doesn't have as much space to move, and now we start to see some maybe some just fascial tightness because the majority of pain that people come in with, as I say, my muscles hurt, it's really fascial tightness. But if that starts to become limited in motion, we start to see these overuse in one plane of motion at a particular joint, that's where we start over time start to see arthritic changes. Now we start this cycle that needs to be broken. So ankle dorsiflexion is critically important. But let's go to an injury now. Let's say you've got a client who has sprained an ankle, and they can't weight bear very well. So if they're non-weight bearing, the tissues have to heal. The tissues become short and tight with adhesions. They start walking. Uh, the gait is a little bit limited, it's, it's shorter, they don't load as well, the foot doesn't go through full what we call pronation or eversion, um, that is going to create lack of rotation through the entire chain, and now ankle dorsiflexion is becoming limited. Their symptoms may be gone now, they may have gone through rehab, and the, re, the therapist may have said, all right, you're discharged, uh, your inflammation's down, your pain is good, the, quote, function is good. 
But here's the issue. When we talk about ankle dorsiflexion, I look at foot and ankle complex as four primary movements that take place. I mean, you've got 33 joints, you've got 24 muscles and 26 bones in the foot, and there's a lot of things that go on down there, but I think we can categorize it by saying for the foot and ankle to be successful, you need ankle dorsiflexion, calcaneal eversion, so in other words, where the, the, the rear foot pronates, the rear foot's going to move further and faster than the forefoot, so the forefoot is now going to be relatively outside or abducted to the rear foot, and the tibia has to internally rotate. So you've got four components there that if any one of those become limited in motion, such as limited ankle dorsiflexion, everything else is going to be affected, and now the system is slowly shutting itself down because it doesn't go through the full excursion of three planes of motion. So we can look at lifestyle that could limit ankle dorsiflexion. You could look at injury. You could look at a hip, ex, a hip strain, hip flexor strain, that will create the same reaction because that strain doesn't allow the hip to extend. The ankle is not going to go into ankle dorsiflexion as well. So there's a myriad of opportunities for that ankle to shut down and have an effect upon the rest of the system. And, and see, I mean, that sounds, and you know, for listeners, that's like you're kind of going, what, huh? It sounds so complicated, and it does take a while. I and mean, when I first started learning that as a trainer, and I have to tell you, Chuck, it, it's, it's fun talking to you, and I always enjoy um, you, know, you know shooting the breeze with you when I bump into you at conferences and stuff. Because when I was learning this stuff a number of years ago, I read you had two or three articles on PT on the net relating abdominal function and foot function. And I have to say, do you know? Do you remember those articles? Oh yes, I do. Because <laughs> I have to say, if you had seen me. You know, if you've been in downtown D.C. maybe about 12, 14 years ago in the early 2000s, you would have seen me walking up 18th Street from the gym I worked in to where I, where I lived in Adams Morgan. I had my hands on my tummy. I had my hands on my butt. I had my hands <laughs> on my inner thighs because I was trying to take in all this information. And one of those articles is so powerful, and I don't know if you can you can tap, tap, touch on a little bit, but it's about how you, you kind of touched into it just 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 a little bit now but tying in foot function into abdominal function because I'm one of these people that I really think personally, I think for people listening out there, I think the current term core training is dead. It, I, call, I kind of uh, call it like Fon, it's like Fonzie jumping the shark. It just is, we don't need to use the term core training anymore because everything works together and it becomes such an overutilized term that anytime our foot hits the ground, our deep abdominal muscles are working. Talk a little bit about kind of how our feet, you did just a little bit, but extrapolate a little bit more about how the feet and the abdominals communicate with each other and why that's so important to consider. So, Pete, well, when I totally agree with you that core, you know, core training or, or core stability is, is an archaic term because what's interesting is when I am speaking at conferences and I ask people what, what is the core, people will say, well, they commonly say, well, it's the hips and the torso, which I agree with. It's the glutes, the abdominals. I agree with that. But when we walk, um, and if people who are in the audience that are listening to you now, um, if they would just stand up and place the left foot as if they're in mid, as if they're in stride, have the left foot forward and the right foot back, and um, through the gait pattern, your left, I'm sorry, your right arm is forward with your left leg and your left arm is back with your right leg. Well, what happens there is a few things. One, in this position, and we're just doing a freeze frame right now, Pete, so obviously it's, we're not going to be going through movement yet, but in this position, the pelvis, the hips are facing a bit to the right and the torso and the shoulders are facing a little bit to the left. So the abdominals are lengthened, lengthened from the right hip to the left shoulder, and the glutes are, are lengthened from the left glute into the right lat. So you've got, and these tissues are all connected. Now, as if somebody were to just shorten their stride for a moment, they're going to see that the abdominals aren't, aren't turned on as much or activated as much because if you shorten your stride, your right arm uh, isn't going to reach as far forward. If they lengthen the stride, and then start pushing through their metatarsals, through their, the ball of their foot, especially off the great toe, they're going to feel more extension of the right hip. The right hip feeds into the abdominal complex by fascial connection, 
And when that right hip is extended, there's a slight anterior tilt or that hip is tilting a bit forward. Well, that's lengthening the abdominals even further. And as you rotate your shoulders a bit more, you're going to see that there's lengthening on an angle. So that's through rotation. As that right hip is extended a bit more, that's lengthened through extension or the sagittal plane. And then just before you, you, uh, your right toe comes off or actually as the right heel comes up and you're bending the ball of the foot, there's a slight shift to the left onto your left hip and left lower extremity, which lengthens the abdominals on the right side inside the side movement to, to, hold, to hold your stability. So all of a sudden the abdominals are working in three planes of motion. But what creates this? Well, we talked about the great toe all of a sudden as you go through pushing off or extending through the metatarsals of the ball of the foot of the right foot, you're getting extension there. But if you're limited in motion in that area, you're not going to have as much extension, so the hip won't extend as much, so the abdominals won't be lengthened as much. If you have, by chance, a hip strain on the right side, you're not going to be able to extend through there as much, so the hip won't tilt forward as much, and you're not going to get that lengthening in the sagittal plane of that extension, which is also going to limit your ability to rotate to the opposite side, in this case the left, so now the abdominals aren't getting activated as much. But let's assume for the moment, Pete, that you have somebody who had this shoulder injury or shoulder surgery, and their right shoulder is, and their right arm is in a sling. You're going to see that they're not going to rotate as much, and the abdominals aren't going to get turned on as much. And these these clients often complain of, you know, I feel a little bit of tightness in the low back or around the, the sacrum and the SI joint because the hips aren't rotating as much. So all of a sudden, the arm, which is which attaches to the shoulder and the shoulder musculature attaches to the back and the, and the pecs, which all feed around to the abdominals and meet through fascial connections of the obliques and the transverse abdominis and the rectus abdominis. All of a sudden, everything filters through there. And we saw that the great toe, it could be an ankle, it could be a hip, it could be a thoracic spine problem, it could be a shoulder problem that are all limited or any one of these limited in motion, and that's all going to filter through the abdominal complex, and you're not going to have them eccentrically loaded or lengthened first, and then they're not going to stabilize and they're not going to unload or shorten afterwards as efficiently as they normally would. And and see this, well, if if I can stop you there for one second, because this seems so, what you just did, I mean, you walked through the the biomechanics perfectly and this explains, so for listeners, if you're sitting there going, well, all I want to do is a few crunches, it's much more complicated than that, (laughs) right? Because, you know, we have this whole misconceived notion that we can isolate a muscle within our body with a single exercise, yet there is no way to really isolate. And one thing I've observed, Chuck, and I don't know if you've noticed this, but one thing I've observed in the gym is that when people run with, instead of having a sling on their arm, if they have like a, a phone or a music player attached to their upper arm, I've noticed it changes one arm. If I'm wearing, if I'm wearing my phone on my right arm, and I'm trying to run on the treadmill, I've noticed that the right arm doesn't move far, doesn't move the same as my left arm. And Absolutely I've correct. With, that, with running, and then I've also noticed this, in, in, you know, with spending time in airports, that if people are like, if they're holding a bag in one shoulder, then it, it, again, it, it changes their gait pattern. Is that something that people should pay attention to? Just little things like that, little details like that? Oh, Pete, you're hitting on, again, a common lifestyle activity and a common lifestyle you know, habits that people do. And it's interesting because I know I'm a victim of this as well, walking through an airport uh, and I've got my, my roller bag that I'm pulling along. I feel the difference on one side to the other. I feel it in the hip and then I feel it in the low back and I've got a switch and, or even carrying a backpack. You're right. When you have this asymmetry, particularly if it's, if it's weighted or it creates a compensation and the lack of movement, you're going to feel it somewhere. And, uh, and often you know, we, we start to feel it either in the shoulder or or in the hip or in the in the back. And, you know, you said a moment ago in the gym, the most common thing that people do is they'll do an abdominal crunch. That's going to shorten the tissue. That's going to limit the motion in all three planes of motion. 
I'm not going to say don't do it because, again, that goes back to our discussion <laughs> of wants and needs. If you have to do it, I would say do it first. And the reason I'm saying do it first or earlier in the exercise program, because we know it's one point of motion. We know it's going to shorten the tissue. We've got the rest of the program to then eccentrically load it in all three planes of motion and gain that mobility as well as that stability back. So that way we can meet both ends of the movement spectrum. We can meet the needs and the wants of the client without them really knowing about it. And I think that's the really important thing because a lot of people, and it comes back to this, you know, the reason why, you know, I like talking with you, I like talking with, with Gary, and, and I've also had Gary Gray on here, or Gary, uh, Gray Cook, sorry, Gray Cook, I even get those guys confused, <laughs> is, uh, and what I'm trying to get people to understand is exercise is much more than working just isolated muscle parts, you know, working much more than isolated body parts. It's much more than, like, I'm going to do some chest exercise, I'm going to do some leg exercises, that when you work with somebody with Chuck, like Chuck's experience or some of my other guests, we're looking at the whole. We're not looking at, at you as an individual part, a leg versus a shoulder versus a chest. We're looking at the whole piece. And are people, when, when your clients, and, and I know many of your clients have been referred to you um, because they're injured, but once they go through the training program, how, how quickly does it take to them to get back to their favorite activities? If my favorite activity is mountain biking or my favorite activity is skiing, and I, there's so many variables in here, Chuck. I know it's a really tough tough um, question to answer emphatically, but just in general, if I come in with, you know, complaining of a bad back or, or a bad hip or whatever, about how many – is it a long time before I can get back to my favorite activity or is it sometimes just a matter of a few sessions? And I know there's a lot of variability in that question. You're, you're right, Pete. There is a lot of variability. A lot of it has to do with – the length of time of the injury, the type of injury that they've had, is it a is it a soft tissue uh, problem or is it an osseous bony structure problem? Has there been any neurological involvement? But generally speaking, uh, assuming it's let's let's just I don't even know what percentage. I know for years we've heard the the percentage that about eighty percent of people at some point in their life develop problems with their low back. Well, is that just muscle soreness, that myofascial tightness? Is The point being is let's assume the, the most common, nothing that is deep, uh, severe injury or neurological issues, I think you could start seeing changes within, I think people get back to their activities in 10 to 14 days and their symptoms start to subside. Some take maybe maybe up to a month, but it doesn't take very long if you're able to to provide the right strategy for the individual, and that's the thing. It's for each individual. It's not just this generic formula that we're going to throw across to everybody. It's what is going on with the individual movements of that particular person and make it very personalized for them. They can get back to their activities relatively quick. However, the thing we've got to look at is what is their ability to be able to control the movement and what is their ability to be able to help stabilize, particularly the the low back. Um, so many injuries that I've evaluated, and I've been blessed to work with probably the leading neurosurgeon in the country, uh, is that so many of the, his patients want to get back to their activities, but one, do they have the, we're going to use that common term, that core stability, but do they also have the strength to control their movements in the hips and reduce that excessive forces or excessive stress to the low back? So I want to make sure that that client is stable first before they do whatever activity, particularly dynamic activity that you do out there, such as getting on your mountain bike or on your trail bike. There's a lot of shock waves that go through the system. You better be able to mitigate those forces and dampen the stress in that region. But it doesn't have to, it will not take that long if the movements are coming from the right regions. Well, and that's something important to, as we wrap up here, I think that's something important for, for listeners to, to take hold to is the trend has been a lot of, there's a trend of looking for people that look great on Instagram or looking for people that look great on social media, and wow, this person looks awesome, I'm going to buy their exercise program. 
and they might pay, you know, you might pay twelve dollars or twenty dollars, whatever it is, to download an exercise program. And I don't want to, I don't want to knock that because it's getting people to move, right? People are starting. Any exercise is better than no exercise. But right. why is it so important to work with somebody that has your type of movement background? And what, would it be worth somebody doing a few sessions with with a trainer that understands movement before they go to an off the shelf program? Well, Pete, being an old guy in the business these days, in the industry... Um, yeah. uh, you're not that old, no. But uh, <laughs> uh, I cringe at some of the things I see on social media. I absolutely cringe because, hey, the fitness industry itself is you know, relatively unregulated. And you may look good and, and look great in the gym, and somebody walks in and says, I want to look like that that woman or that man... Uh, what are you doing? And they start showing them, and all of a sudden they're a personal trainer. I've got big problems with that because because they may not know the indications, contraindications to not only movement but also the medical history that that client may may present with. Uh, so social media has a lot of interesting things, but what's the rationale behind it? What's the rationale of, and, and the whys of that they're doing some of these circus movements? And I'm, I've got a big problem with that. So to go back to your point, it would definitely behoove a potential client to work with a high-level trainer who understands movement, who will go through a medical history and look at the indications, contraindications, the red flags that come up that say, you know, here's some precautions we're going to have to do in our exercise planning, our exercise programming, or, you know, here's some things that um, it just doesn't look right. You better get medical clearance first. And I can tell you some uh, story upon story upon story of people who presented to me with wanting to, to exercise for whatever it might be or to prepare for a sport and based on their medical history or based upon the gait and motion analysis and movement evaluation that I referred them to docs, and there's been some underlying issues there that they could not exercise. So you need to find a, a fitness professional, a movement professional who understands not just the movement, but understands how to read health histories, understand the cardiovascular implications that are involved with certain conditions such as blood pressure or heart rhythm issues or diabetes or just, you know, obesity um, that understands the complications, not just of each one of those individually, but the complications and the complexities when you have clients that come in with multiple risk factors and multiple uh, medical considerations. So it would definitely behoove them to do so and then figure it out from there. Well, and that's one of my fears, right, Chuck, is that I think a lot of people, again, it comes down to, People think it's only exercise, it's only working out, but I don't think a lot of people realize, and I say this on almost every every interview I, I, I do, it comes to a point where exercise, I want to remind people that exercise is stress on the body. You know, how that stress is introduced and the level which it's introduced is going to make all the difference between being injured and being able to be back to your favorite activity. Don't you think that's often overlooked? That people forget that fundamentally, that by definition, exercise is stress, right? Oh, Pete, is, you hit the nail squarely on the head. It is a stress upon the body. It needs to be titrated into the system properly, uh, and and they'll have better results. It, in today's day and age, in today's world, we want the quick fix. But at the same time, as I tell people, your injury or your deconditioning didn't come overnight. Don't expect it to come back overnight. And um, you have to introduce the, the various stress loads to to have a – reduce risk of injury, reduce risk of complications, but also have the most optimal results. And it isn't just for somebody who um, who is just starting exercise again. It's also for the highest level athlete who's out there who's been injured or had some limitation and they're trying to work through that. You've got to scale back and then build it back up. You are absolutely correct. Yeah, and I did, so I'm looking at your book here, Insights into Functional Training. What This is a new book just came out this past year, right? Right at the end of 2017? Yes, sir. It came out in October. And what uh, what's, it, what's it cover? Obviously, it covers functional training. But in terms of, like, um, what, what, do you, what, do, what will people learn by picking up your book? Well, um, 
what we go heavily into first is understanding joint by joint. Well, first we go into the concepts of what functional training may be, what function means, because again, it's the buzzword. I call it the F word in the in the fitness business, but it hasn't had a universal definition. And I haven't heard you say that, Chuck, but I like that a lot. <laughs> Uh, uh, so we try and introduce what the concepts are, and at least certain characteristics. I prefer using human movement rather than the word function. But what are the what are the concepts, and what are some of the principles behind it? Uh, we go into three dimensional joint by joint movement of as we quickly went through it and gait of what goes on with the foot and ankle and how that's affecting the hip. We go into that uh, fairly in depth. There's a functional anatomy chapter that. If I may say, uh, Pete has uh, uh, some incredible dissections in here, and uh, those pages are glossy, high color that really discusses not only the tissues and shows the tissues and the fascial connections, but what goes on in three planes of motion. Um, I've, I've been a huge advocate of flexibility, but integrated flexibility through my flexibility highways programs over the years. We go into flexibility. We talk about the importance of the big movement rocks, the foot and ankle complex, even the great toe as far as the foot and ankle complex, the hips and thoracic spine, and that the limitations in those regions really, I believe, account for a lot of the common injuries that we see, such as lumbar spine injury, such as knee injury, such as shoulder injury. Then uh, we go into blending traditional training with functional training and go into some program design, uh, go into some uh, assessment uh, uh, movements and how and I see and and how I then blend that into strategies for for program design and we talk a bit about movement training for special populations at least from a movement standpoint from knee hip shoulder uh, back issues and uh, how this all came about Pete is I did um, on my Facebook page about three years ago, I would put up what we would call inside of the week. And I was amazed at the, and the inside of the week was just what I saw in the trenches. Just things you don't read in books. Here's some common things that I've seen on what has happened with people with back issues. Here's the common things that I see of what goes on with, uh, for instance, a, we're just going to call it generically a flat foot. There's different reasons why there's a flat foot, but we'll call it a flat foot and how that seem to correlate with about 75 to 80 percent of ACL injuries that I've evaluated that there's been a rear foot control problem and it looks like a flat foot. So, so many of these insights and the feedback I would get is what spurred on the thought of and the title of the book, Insights to Functional Training, but there's a chapter on these insights and you don't find it in peer-reviewed studies. It's just things that I've seen on a reproducible basis some of the uh, issues such as knee, back, hip, shoulder, uh, some of the strategies that I've been lucky enough to be successful with in helping for corrective strategies for these populations, also some things that didn't work that I learned from as well, and that's where the, that's where the book goes, and we just kind of beat around what those insights are about. And um, I need to put the principles, concepts, and applications because everything – tries to revolve around the principles of movement and how do we apply some of these strategies and the concepts, and that's how the principles, concepts, and application standpoint. Everything seems, at least I attempted to make, solution-oriented and, well, and that, uh, it's, reproducible. And you've always done that, Chuck. I mean, anytime I've sat in on one of your, one of your lectures or called one of your seminars, I've always, you know, I always appreciate the brevity and the practical application you bring to it. Are you going to be doing? You. Are you going to be going out on the road uh, this year, speaking at any of the idea events or doing any of the, of the other shows? Uh, yes, sir. I will be at both uh, Personal Trainer uh, uh, Institute for Idea in in uh, Alexandria, Virginia, and in Dallas this year, and I will be at World Event. Um, I will be speaking uh, at the Perform Better. Uh, some of the perform better events, and uh, we will be talking about insights into functional training. Cool, awesome! Well, I'm going to try to make it to a couple of those events. I'm actually going to be doing a, a little bit of podcasting with Idea for Idea, 
So oh, very uh, cool. Might be at one or two of those events uh, doing that, and I need to reach out to, to Chris and pitch him on that idea too. But and your website, Chuck, is Human Human Motion Associates and uh, HumanMotionAssociates dot com. Yes. And what and what can people find uh, on your website? Uh, we've got on the website. We've got um, uh, obviously a page that just talks about the services, but there's a blog page that we. I Pete, this year it's my goal to get more consistent with the blog page, but uh, some articles, some videos on there, uh, our products page, and um, there's some articles that, that people can link to, and also some of the resources, or I should say some of the other associates and colleagues, I think, have really good information that will link to their websites or to some of their information. So um, it's fairly easily you can navigate around it, and all we want to do is just share information and provide information for that. Well, Chuck, I appreciate that, and, man, I appreciate what you do, and it's certainly fun to uh, to catch up with you and hear some insights, and uh, I look forward to hopefully bumping into you sometime in the near future. Pete, the, the problem with our schedules is that, you know, especially when we go to these these major conferences, we're all so busy. We say a quick hello, we chat for a few minutes, but we never get the time to sit down and you know, have have something to eat or just find out how everybody's doing. And I would sure love to have that opportunity with you if we can make that happen this year. Well, I'm sure we will. And, Chuck, one of the things, one of the reasons why I started doing this podcast is because some of the amazing conversations I've had with other educator, educators and some of the insights and just some of the, 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 the things that we come up with while just conversating, I thought it would be a great idea to try to record that and share that and, and help people understand a little bit more uh, behind fitness and and learn literally all about fitness. So I really appreciate your time for this. Well, Pete, I'm, you're the one I want to thank for giving me the opportunity because it's uh, people like you uh, who, one, have raised the standard of the industry for for many, many years. And uh, for you to give me the opportunity to, to share with you, I greatly appreciate, the, especially considering the fact that you've had other wonderful presenters and guests on your show. Uh, that means a lot. So thank you very much for the opportunity. All right, man. Well, you take care of yourself, Chuck, and we'll be—I'll be in touch. I'll let you know when this goes live, and uh, and that way you can uh, share it with your uh, with your network. I appreciate it, buddy. It's great talking to you. Hopefully, that didn't get a little too technical for you, but it was a fun conversation to have, and I wanted to have it because, again, I'm trying to help you understand that we need to move better if we want to be able to exercise better. We need to be able to move better. If we want to enjoy our favorite activities better, we need to be able to move better if, if we want to get the most out of life. You know, exercise isn't just about, you know, getting stronger, or just isn't about appearance. Exercise is about enhancing your overall quality of life. And I've used the tagline many times before, but exercise and fitness is really having the ability, and it's, fitness is more the ability. Fitness is having the ability to do what you want to do when you want to do it. And that starts with how you move. Your body has to move as an integrated, you know, one system. Your, your right ankle connects to your left shoulder. Your left ankle connects to your right shoulder. If, if a muscle gets out of balance somewhere in the chain, if something in your foot, you know, if your, your calf becomes too tight, it's going to affect the way your hip works. And here's the funny thing. If your left calf gets tight, it can affect your right hip. You know, if your right hip gets a little gunky, meaning it doesn't move in all three planes of motion when you need it, need it to, then loss of motion in your right hip could affect your opposite shoulder, your left shoulder, and it could also affect your low back. So there really is, you know, th- there's a specific science in understanding how our bodies move. Because And for years, for years, the industry studied exercise as a function of what's one muscle doing or what's one limb doing. And we, we kind of got that from doing cadaver dissections. We looked at where a muscle started and ended, which joint it crossed, and we you know, said, oh, wow, hey, this muscle does, you know, crosses this joint. It must perform this function. But in reality, when we're up on our feet and we're moving, and we move through three planes of motion, and we have to deal and handle the forces of gravity, you know, our body works as, as one integrated system. So if you're looking for, you know, if you're one of these people that finds exercise boring, and let's face it, sometimes it can be excruciatingly boring if all you're doing is, is sitting on a cardio machine and then going from you know weight training machine to weight training machine. And keep in mind that once you move better, weight training machines are awesome because that the weight training machines like Nautilus are one of the best ways to add strength and add size. 
you know, when you work on functional movement, you can't use heavy loads. So you're kind of limited to how much you can, you know, initiate muscle growth. But when you work on a machine, you're in relative isolation. So you can use significantly really heavy loads to initiate strength and muscle growth. So there's a balance. You know, we don't only have to do movement training. And that was a mistake that the fitness industry did maybe 12 to 15 years ago. When, when functional training first became popular in the early 2000s, we kind of forgot to pick up the strength training. You know, we kind of forgot that, hey, if muscle growth needs resistance, getting stronger means you need to lift heavy weights. And so when, when this whole high intensity thing evolved in the late 2000s and early you know, 2010s, it really, you know, people gravitate to that because that's when you see results. But now after lifting heavy for a number of years, I think we're starting to shift back to the concept of functional training and understanding the role that movement plays in exercise. Because you can't just do a high volume of strength training and not get injured. <laughs> you will get injured. So it's important to do, if you do strength training, to do it for you know, a number of weeks or maybe two or three months at a time, but then give a few weeks you know, off of where you focus on movement so you move better. Move your hips, move your shoulders. You know, I'm in my 40s now, and I have a deeper squat now than any time in my life, but I've been working very hard on it. I've been working on hip mobility, because if you lose hip mobility, it's going to affect how your spine functions. Everything is tied in together. So again, hopefully we didn't get over your head, but I wanted to have that conversation with Chuck because I, I want you to understand that you know everything you know relates to everything else in your body. If you really want to understand that and, and understand... I'm going to say understand again, but if you really want to understand that and know how you can uh, design programs for yourself, I really highly recommend his book, Insights into Functional Training. Also, you can check out his website. I'll have both those links down in the show notes. Thanks for stopping by All About Fitness. If you're enjoying this content, if you're finding that it's useful, if you're finding that it's helpful, if you're finding that it's really making a difference in your life, can you do us a favor and give us a quick review? However you listen to All About Fitness, whether it's iTunes or Stitcher, you know the way the system works, guys, is that the more reviews you get, the higher up in the search rankings you go when people are searching for fitness podcasts. So um, no money here, no money charged yet. I shouldn't say yet, but no money charged. You know, I'm trying to bring the best information to you. And all I ask in return is you take a moment to give us a positive review. Thanks for stopping by All About Fitness. If you want to connect with me, shoot me an email, Pete at PeteMcCallFitness.com. That's Pete at PeteMcCallFitness.com. You can also uh, Instagram, that's Pete McCall underscore fitness. That's Pete McCall underscore fitness on Instagram. And Twitter is Pete MC underscore fitness. So I look forward to having you join me for future episodes of All About Fitness.